the Buddha was once asked, will the whole world gain awakening, or one half, or one third? And he didn't answer. It was a Brahmin who asked the question. Venerable Ananda was sitting by, and he was concerned that the Brahmin might get upset. He had asked an important question, and the Buddha was silent. So he took the Brahmin off to one side, and he gave him an analogy. He said, it's like a wise gatekeeper. He's looking after a fortress, and he walks all around the fortress, and aside from the gate, he doesn't see any hole in the wall at all, not even one big enough for a cat to slip through. I like that detail. And so he doesn't know how many people are going to go in and out of the fortress, but he does know that if they're going to go in and out of the fortress, they have to go by the gate. And the gate, of course, is the practice of the four establishings of mindfulness, the seven factors for awakening. But it's interesting. The Buddha wouldn't know how many people were going to get an awakening. It's because we have freedom of choice. It's up to us to decide if we want to follow the path, not follow the path. Even the Buddha couldn't make us all want to follow the path. And John Mahabhava says one time that if people would attain nirvana, could take it out and show to everybody else, and no, nobody would want anything else but nirvana. But can't be shown like that. So people go through their lives without any care about it at all. So even the Buddha can't awaken everybody. As he said, he taught those who were ready to be taught. Even though he had compassion for all beings, goodwill for all beings. Still, there are only so many that he could teach. It's good to keep this in mind. It gives you some perspective on the practice of equanimity. Equanimity in and of itself is never recommended as skillful. It has to be combined with other qualities. But it does not like, say a reality check on the Brahma Viharas. We have goodwill for all beings. May they be happy. May they understand the causes for true happiness and be willing and able to act on them. May they look after themselves with ease. Compassion. May all beings be freed from all stress and pain. Empathetic joy. May those who are happy not be deprived of their happiness. These are the wishes we can have for all. But it's not the case that everybody's going to become happy. Because after all, they have to choose the path that leads to true happiness. It's not that you can touch them on the head with a magic wand and make them happy. They have to behave skillfully in their thoughts, their words and deeds, and this is their choice. They have this freedom to do it or not do it. And at the same time, everybody has a past of karma. Good things, bad things they've done in the past. You have your past. Good things, bad things you've done. And so those actions are going to place a limitation on you. Your actions, their actions. And so that you don't get into suffering over the fact that all beings will not become happy. You have to realize it's going to be up to them. And of course, if you're going to be happy, it's up to you. Now you do what you can to influence others. It's not the case that you cannot influence other people. Look at the Buddha. He taught lots of people the way to awakening, who were able to take advantage of that. If it hadn't been for him, who knows where they would have gone. And we each can exert our influence on the world as best we can. But there's going to be limitations on that influence. It's like the practice of generosity. You want all beings to be happy, but you, can, you only have so many resources in terms of your wealth, your time, your energy. So you have to be willing to take that into account and focus your your energies on areas where you can be of help. This is why, as I said earlier, equanimity is your reality check. It also requires discernment. How much you're going to try to help somebody before you 
saying, I can't, this person is beyond my help, I've got to chalk it up to karma. That's going to depend on your own powers of observation and your own connection with the person. It's interesting that that passage the, that's used to contemplate equanimity, all beings are the heirs of their actions, born of their actions, related through their actions, live dependent on their actions, whatever they do for good or for evil, to that will they fall heir. It reminds you not only of karma, but also makes you think in the larger term. And this is where it's related not just equanimity in the in the suttas, it's related actually to contemplation. And the Buddha says, when you think reflect on this, first you're the owner of your actions. And that thought should get you heedful about what you're going to do and say, I think you realize okay, my actions are going to have consequences. I've got to be careful what I choose to say and do and think. When you start thinking, however, that all beings are the owners of their actions, it means that wherever you could go in the cosmos, the highest level of devas, any place that seems really desirable, you still would be an heir to your actions. And that, the Buddha says, is enough to give you the desire to get on the path. In other words, it induces a strong sense of sanghwega, that wherever you could go, you would still be subject to aging, illness, and death. You'd still be subject to separation, and you'd still have to be really careful about your actions. You can't get complacent. You have to be on your guard at all times. And that's enough to, when you think about it, just say, this, I've had enough, I've got to find the way out. And that induces you to get on the path. Because the path is a path of action. Right view, right resolve, all the way through right concentration. These are things you do. They're all fabrications. As the Buddha said, of all fabricated dhammas, this is the highest, the noble eightfold path. It's something you have to put together. So when you reflect on the nature of the world, reflect on your relationship with other beings, and you realize the limitations. That's when you decide, well, I want to go for something unlimited. They say that the Brahma Viharas are measureless. But they're not nearly as unlimited as total, total release. That's what we aim for. The equanimity, equanimity shows up in two other places, basically at the same place. In the practice of discernment and in the practice of concentration. In this case, the Buddha lists levels of equanimity. You start out with their ordinary, everyday equanimity, just that you make up your mind that whatever you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or think about, you're going to be equanimous. And this is where you practice what some people call bare awareness, bare attention. But it's actually an intention not to react. So it's not totally bare. One of the Buddha's recommendations is if someone criticizes you, you tell yourself, okay, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. And when the contact ends, the sound ends. Can you leave it there? For most of us, that's not the case. Someone criticizes us and we take it in and, as the Buddha said, it reverberates to the mind. We have to remind yourself that everything beyond the contact is something you're responsible for. So you try to develop some equanimity that people will say things, do things that you're not going to like, and you have to put up with it. Yeah, you have to find a state of mind where you can be okay with these things. And it has to go beyond just the resolve that you're going to be okay. This is where you go to higher levels of equanimity. On the one hand, there's the equanimity that comes from insight. And the Buddha, Buddha's analysis of this is interesting. He says there's householder equanimity, which is what I just described. And then there's renunciate equanimity. And the way you go from one to the next is interesting. From householder equanimity, you go to what he calls renunciate pain, which is when you realize that there is freedom. 
There is total release, and I'm, there are people who have attained that, but I'm not there yet. That thought is a painful thought. There's a freedom that I haven't attained. But there's also hope. Other people can do it. Why, why can't I do it? So it is important to have a goal as you practice. It's simply learning how to relate to the goal well. If you're going to go on a weekend retreat, often they will recommend that you don't have a goal. Some people say, well, weekend, maybe, maybe first jhana. Second jhana, if things go really well. But that's putting yourself in a pressure cooker. And people who lead weekend retreats have learned that. So they say, we well, have no goals, just sort of be here without any idea of where you want to go, which is okay for a weekend retreat. But when you take the practice as a life practice, you have to have goals. And there is a pain that goes with having a goal that you haven't attained yet. But the mature attitude is to say, okay, I can work at this step by step by step. I can get there. And as you develop insight along the way, and you see that the more insight you gain into the workings of your mind, the more freedom you have, there's going to be a sense of joy. You can tell yourself, greed used to overcome my mind, but now I can see through my greed. There's a sense of joy that comes with that. Or I used to be subject to anger, subject to jealousy, but now I can see through those things. They don't have that power they had before. There's a sense of joy. So you go from renunciate pain to renunciate joy. And then from renunciate joy, then you go for renunciate equanimity. The mind is at calm and at peace. So that's the kind of equanimity that you actually actively cultivate through insight. If insight teaches you things are inconstant, stressful, not self, and you get kind of resigned to that fact, but it doesn't give rise to joy. It, it, the insight is not genuine insight. There has to be a sense of freedom and release that comes when you really understand what's going on in the mind. Similarly with concentration. I mean, at the highest levels of concentration, there is a sense of equanimity. But you first have to go through it, a sense of pleasure and rapture, or refreshment. As you're meditating right here, right now, try to find a way of breathing that's pleasant. It can be neutrally pleasant or more positively pleasant. But it feels okay. And from okay, you look after it. As you said earlier, you tie the word is brakong. You hover around it, you protect it, look after it. The same way that a parent would hover over a child learning to walk. You don't grab the child, but you're there, attentive, right by it, looking after it, tending to it. That sense of okay will grow. Then you can think of it spreading through the body. This is where John Lee's instructions come in handy. The canon simply says you have a sense of pleasure and rapture, and then you let it permeate the body. And as he points out, it's really helped when you can think of the breath energy flowing through the body. And then the pleasure goes along the breath channels, goes along with the sense of energy flowing into the arms, flowing into the legs, flowing into the head and torso. And there can be a sense of fullness. As we mentioned, one of the ways you can induce that sense of fullness is to focus on your hands. Notice as you breathe in, is there any slight tensing up in anywhere in the hand? If there is, let it go. Release it. So the hand feels full as you breathe in, feels full as you breathe out. That sense of fullness will grow. And as it develops, then you can think of it going up the arms into the chest. You can do the same with your feet, up the legs, into the chest, into the torso. 
And it can be a real sense of satisfaction just sitting and breathing in, breathing out. And as you get deeper into, into concentration, the sense of pleasure will get more intense, the rapture will get more intense. It, it even gets to the point where the rapture feels burdensome. It feels like it's too much. And at that point, you focus in on a level of energy that's more refined. As you focus on that more refined level, then the, the grosser sense of rapture will gradually dissipate. And the mind feels very equanimous at that point. There will be a sense of pleasure still in the body, very subtle. And John Lee's images of an ice cube with vapor coming off of it. And then as everything in the body connects, you get to the point where you realize you haven't been breathing. The sense of breath energy in the body is totally sufficient, totally still. And that way, concentration can deliver you to both equanimity of mind and equanimity of body. But notice that in this case, too, you go through pleasure, you go through rapture or refreshment. You don't simply force the mind to be equanimous through force of will. You're coming out the other side of having fed the mind and fed thus your inner sense of the body well. So the equanimity comes from a sense of satisfaction. Your own internal needs are met, and you can view the world with a lot more peace, with less hunger. And then it's based both on the insight and on the concentration that you continue to develop the path, fabricating the path. Using whatever insight you have for us to pry away any distractions from the mind that would pull you out of concentration. And then you apply the same analysis to the concentration itself. There's an interesting passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about the typical way of dealing with distractions or dealing with defilements. You try to see their origination, you try to see, in other words, how they get caused in the mind, what comes up with them when they come. You see them as they pass away, and then you see them as they come back. When they come back, you have to ask yourself, what's the allure? What pulls your mind to go for them? And this is you have to watch for many, many times, because the mind will often lie to itself, especially when it knows that it shouldn't be going for something, but it wants to anyhow. What's the real appeal? When you can finally see what it is, and you've seen the drawbacks, then there's dispassion for it, and you realize, I, I don't need to make this anymore. The question came up the other day about destruct, destroying a defilement and abandoning a defilement, having it cease. Why did the Buddha use all those terms? Well, it's the defilement has been something you've been fabricating all along. It's been fabricating out of passion. And when you develop dispassion, then you're going to stop fabricating it. And when you stop fabricating it, it ends. That's how it gets destroyed. So all these things go together. Now, as you deal with your defilements like this, you turn around and you realize that this state of concentration is, is, has the same sort of thing. This is where the interesting passage comes in, where the Buddha says you apply that same analysis to what are, what are called the five strengths, the five faculties. Conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. You see their origination, too. You see their passing away. You see their allure. You see their allure in helping you to get past a lot of the suffering you've been inflicting on yourself. You also see the drawbacks. They're fabricated. You have to keep on making them, keep on intending in their direction. There comes a point where the mind says, wouldn't it be better to have something unfabricated? And when it can genuinely incline itself in that direction, there will be an opening. And as the Buddha said, it's the highest happiness possible.
But here too, there's an equanimity which is a side effect. Once the mind's needs have been satisfied, the need for a genuine happiness it can rely on, then its attitude toward everything else will be very equanimous. Now, this doesn't mean you no longer care about anyone else. Remember, the ideal equanimity is also imbued with goodwill and compassion and empathetic joy. Simply that now you don't have to feed off of other people. You don't have to feed off of your equanimity or your compassion. And that's when the help that you give to other people is totally free. And totally without selfishness. I mean, if you're still feeding off your compassion, sometimes your image of yourself as being compassionate can actually get in the way. There was a Dharma teacher one time who once said he didn't want to be born into a world with, where there was no suffering because he wouldn't be able to <coughs> exert his compassion. You have to stop and think. It sounds noble. But then you need other people to be suffering so you can feel good about your compassion. There's something wrong there. The enlightened person, the fully enlightened person's compassion is compassion without need. It's a totally free gift. So those are the different levels of equanimity. There's ordinary, everyday, homegrown variety, where you make up your mind, I'm just not going to react. The equanimity that comes after you've gained some joy from your insights. The equanimity that comes after you've gained a sense of rapture and pleasure with your concentration. And the equanimity that comes when you've tasted total release. So that's the equanimity that we're aiming for. But we use the other ones as needed. But realize that the one that's at the bottom of the ladder, the resolve to simply not react. That's equanimity that needs work, because otherwise you can get depressed. Just, well, this is the way it is, this is the way it is, I've got to accept it, I've got to accept it. That can get very depressed. There has to be a sense of joy, there has to be an inner sense of well-being to undergird your equanimity. So it actually does become part of the path. It leads to total happiness.